G'day, Ben from Duck Playing Chicken here with the next video in this build series of the Bandai 135th Main Battle Tank from the UC Hardgraph uh, kit series. This video is going to be all about painting the figures. The kit includes three figures. And the first thing I've done is I've super glued them to these bases just to make it a bit easier for me to paint them. So if you're interested, these are old school film canisters back in the old days where you used to have to put film into cameras. Uh, and they're perfect for this kind of application. Super gluing the figures on is good because the super glue is quite brittle, which means you can break the figures off without breaking the figure itself and you can just you know you might need a little bit of touch up um, once you've done that but I tend to find this process works really well for me. So the next thing I need to do is prime them and I'm actually going to be priming them all in black to start off with so SMS surface are black and then once that's uh, given time to sort of cure properly I'm actually going to go in with SMS flesh pink for all the skin areas and that's going to be the base color for the skin. So painting the faces and the other flesh areas I'll be using this uh, the Abtolung 502 oils modeling oil sets so these are great for bringing out some of those details in the, the, the skin areas. Now for the rest of the uniforms and stuff, I haven't decided on the colours yet, but I will probably do a base coat in one of the SMS colours and then use Vallejo uh, Mecca colour. So water-based acrylics over the top of that to bring out some highlights and paint some details. So next step is priming. So what I've done is I have primed the figures using SMS Black Primer. And then I've also gone in with the flesh areas with flesh pink. And the reason for that is I'm just going to find that a bit easier than you know, painting that by hand. I'm going to be using oils to uh, do the details on the flesh. But it was just easier for me to sort of get some flesh pink on there first. I'm going to be starting with this uh, figure first. And I'm going to be using Leo Model Air. 71044 light grey green. I'm going to be starting off by just blocking in his uniform. So I've got a number four brush here. I've got a little bit uh, dampened it a bit and I'm just going to do nice thin sort of layers. Now it will take a couple of layers to build up the paint. Anyone who's done sort of any uh, like miniature painting, we'll know that uh, it's all about keeping your, your coats nice and thin. I don't want too much paint on the brush. And just going in. The only thing I'm making sure I'm not doing is painting any of the flesh areas. Obviously because I don't want to contaminate that colour in any way. But as far as the rest of it goes, it's not... Uh, really important at this stage and so I'll be doing his jacket and his pants in this color and then we'll be using a combination of other paint colors to bring out the highlights and then over the top of that we'll probably do some weathering but you can see there's still a lot of the underlying paint showing through but at this stage that's all right because it is just getting a base coat down and it will take a couple of layers. So I'll go ahead and do the rest of this off camera and then I'll show you what that looks like. Okay so I've put this first layer of light grey green down and I think the colour will be good. But you can see how rough it looks. You can still see a lot of the underlying primer uh, paint that I've put on. But that's all right because we build it up in layers. So um, the best way to reduce the number of paint strokes that you can see when you're painting with a brush is to do it in thin layers. I do like uh, brush painting with this Vallejo Model Air just because it is already a bit thinner. You can thin it down a little bit more, but it starts to fall apart. 
So I actually don't mind painting uh, with this stuff. So that's the uh, the first coat there. Now if we have a look at these uh, two other figures here, they've got like light brown sort of pants. So for that I'm going to use the AO Model Air 71031 Middle Stone. And again, I'm just going to do thin coats. Actually, this guy I can take off his, <laughs> his detachable torso. It might make it a bit easier to paint the uh, to paint his legs. You know, I suspect that I've put some thinner in this at some stage. Well, probably when I was airbrushing it, it's very thin. That's all right. And just. Build it up in layers. And you can see I'm not being particularly careful. Things like the little pouches, his belt. I'll uh, do those details once I've got the base color of the pants down. Alright, so I'm going to be that one. And then the next one. Now I should say at this point, there are way better figure painters out there than me. Um, the reason that I sort of do these videos is because there might be a few of you who are actually interested in you know, how I actually go about it myself, even though the, the end result might not be super flash. You might still want to see, at least get an idea of what my learning journey is in painting figures. I think I'm getting a little bit better, but um, at 135th scale, certainly I find it quite tricky to, uh, I tend to find I overwork things a bit on them. So, um, the other thing is too, when we talk about like uh, miniatures, for example, in, in heroic scale and 28mm 28 28mm scale, the, the common method for painting those is really about getting sort of some higher contrast and the reason for that is because it makes it look, it makes the figures look uh, better when they're actually on the playing surface because you can get away with overemphasizing a lot of contrast compared to what you would see in reality and it's just about, you know, because you're talking about a very small figure upping that contrast uh, gives it more presence on the on the playing board but when you're talking about 135th figures of course you're talking about something a little bit larger and so you know there's a lot a lot of uh, painters out there that will still sort of you know up the contrast a little bit but for me I'm not really a big fan of that I'd like to see it a bit more subtle and that's something that I struggle with in achieving with my figures so I know what I want I know what the end result should look like but I struggle to get there so at least you get to see the way I'm doing this stuff warts and all all right I think that'll do for that first coat now for the tops of these two figures I am going to use the AO Model Air 71133 Dirt. So again, really thin coat. I'm not being too precious about the the pouches and the stuff that sort of uh, sits over the top of the, the jacket. Because I can always go back and do that afterwards. It's really about getting just some sort of base colour down. Now you could do this with an airbrush and I was uh, sort of considering it. But uh, I thought... No, I'll do it with a paintbrush. I'll do it with a hairy stick and see, uh, see how we can make it work that way. And these guys have these kind of uh, looks like packs or something on their back, but it looks like it's sort of built into the jacket. So I'm going to use a different color over the top of that to to bring that out a little bit more. There are some decals that uh, go on these figures as well to add a bit more a bit more detail. So that's good. All right, so I'll do the rest of this, I think, off camera. But you get the idea. These are really thin coats. Okay, I'm putting on the second coat for the P-51 
pants and the jacket and so it's really again just nice thin coats every time you put a new coat on you'll get a little bit more color now the fact that I've used a black primer and then I've sprayed a bit of skin tone on there as well I will get a bit of natural variation because this paint is quite uh, quite transparent or quite thin I should say and these guys if they've been sitting in the tank for a while they will be covered in uh, dirt and dust and you know, they'll be exposed to a bit of uh, diesel soot and all sorts of stuff so their, their clothes their uniforms given that they're actually active on the tank means that they shouldn't be wearing pristine freshly pressed uniforms so I'm just going to go ahead and continue on just adding coats so this will be the second one I'll probably dry it off a bit with the hairdryer and then put on another coat and just keep building it up and I'll do that for the gloves the hats and the boots and all the other details and then I'll come back and sort of talk about which paints I use for those and we should have you know, after several coats we should have nice base base colors for all the uh, the clothes the uniform so I've done a little bit more of the base coating of the figures and I just want to talk about some of the colors that I've used here I've still got a few layers to go it's still looking a bit uh, bit rough but for these two figures here you'll notice that their jackets are a slightly different color to their pants and so for that I am using the Hayo model air 71.133 dirt and also a couple of figures have these red uh, berets so for that I am using model air 71084 fire red and finally for all of their gloves um, it, it looks a bit green at the moment but that's just because the undercoat the primer is still coming through but it's actually this um, 71081 tank ochre so so I've still got to put yeah a few more layers on um, I've also done the collars in the red as well um, and there's a few other details that I need to um, still choose colors for like their belts and boots and the little pouches on the side and that sort of thing so still a few uh, few colors I've got to go through to select first but for now I just want to get the base coat on the, the major areas done I've finished the base coat on all the figures and it looks a bit stark especially the skin but that will be darkened up quite a bit with the oils as far as the rest of the sort of uniform goes basically this color is the sort of I guess the darkest um, color and what I'm gonna do is just bring out some of the highlights so I want to talk about some of the colors that I've used um, that I haven't already sort of covered first of all the pinstripes on this guy's jacket incredibly sort of tricky to do so I painted the green uniform but what I needed to do was go in with some white first so this is uh, Vajayo model color 7993 white gray and that was just so I wasn't painting the yellow straight over just the green so it wouldn't have come up and then I used 69004 the Mecca color range yellow so that's for the uh, the sort of pin striping on the the jacket there well we're on this guy the boots and here's patch I did that just with black and I just use this ultimate primer gloss black for his belt it's a bit hard to see maybe if I turn around the back so for his belt I've used again another mecha color 69040 phantom gray and I've also used that gray color for the radios and for the headphones on this guy and 
for the radio and also part of the headphones on this fella as well. Now I used for the rest of the uniform predominantly for these two guys here I used uh, two extra sort of variations of brown 71.122 and 71.023 and so I used those for like the the hat on this guy and the holster also for this uh, I'm not sure what it is like some sort of backpack thing I've just sort of highlighted a bit of detail in there as well and uh, also the um, you know the pouches on the side and so for this guy again for the holster some details on the headset he's wearing so really it was sort of just getting a whole lot of different sort of combinations of brown and green that I could find. So I plan to sort of finish uh, the uniforms completely before I start on the, uh, the flesh. The next thing I'm going to do is take this uh, 71027 light brown and I'm actually going to add a little bit of this to all the base colours. And with that I'll be able to uh, do sort of all my highlighting. And there may be a little bit of, uh, you know, some wash washes that I add a bit later to bring out some of those details. But um, I should also say that this is probably about four or five coats of most of the colours. Like it's taken a while to sort of get a, a good base colour. Thin coats are really important because if you use thick paint, you tend to get, um, you know, you get the paint stroke showing. So I have tried to keep the paint thin but it just takes a lot of coats. And the good thing about water-based acrylics, of course, is that they, they're reasonably quick drying and you can always use a hair dryer. So what I do is I do a coat, I sort of put it aside, move on to the next figure, do a coat, and then I'd go over both of them with uh, the hair dryer. Okay, time to do some highlighting. So I'm gonna use the base green that I've got here, 71044 and mix it with a little bit of 71027. And I'll be mixing this uh, light brown with all the other base colors I've got in order to create the really subtle highlights. I'm not looking at making the highlights really super obvious. I just want them to be, you know, just make it stand out a little bit. So on my palette here, a bit of the green. And then a bit of the light brown. And I'm going to just mix a little bit of this on the side. Now, what I'm after is something that's not, you know, hugely different from the base color. I want to try and keep it reasonably subtle. So you see it's just a lighter shade there. Move the excess of my brush. Pick up a little bit of this. And I'm just going to gently pick out sort of all the, all the edges, the leading edges you would expect to see a highlight. Now, of course, this sort of process is, uh, you know, pretty common with people who paint, you know, uh, minis. So it's not really anything new that I'm doing here. And in fact, it's been... You know, method for painting figures for a long time but it's really just to show you how I do it because I don't do all the super you know I know some mini painters will do layer upon layer of highlights and shadows and all that sort of thing which is great when you're talking about that sort of scale but for me at this sort of scale 135th. Um, I prefer the highlights aren't sort of super obvious. They're not super contrasty. I just want to bring out some of these top areas. There are some decals that go on this particular figure. So certainly there's some um, some red bands that go on his shoulders. There's uh, some emblems that go on his 
uh, upper arms. So I'm really just picking out the, you know, the high spots on the clothing. Not going overboard. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit that with a hair dryer to uh, dry it off a bit quicker so that I can uh, show you what that looks like. A look at it now, you can see there's sort of some subtle highlights. You can see a little bit of the brush strokes in there, but that's all right because I'll be using um, other things to sort of weather it up a little bit. But it just makes the figure, you know, picks out some sort of highlights without going overboard, making it too contrasty, which I think at this size, and, and I mean, this is just my personal opinion, but I think when you see a figure at 135th scale, it's sort of like, you know, if you imagine when you see someone off in the distance, if they're under sort of normal lighting circumstances, you don't actually see a huge amount of contrast in their clothing. Like you you get an idea of the color they're wearing and a little bit of shadow here and there, but you won't get that sort of high contrast uh, that you might expect to see in, in, you know, minis being painted, for example. Time to use the exact same process for the other two figures. And I'm gonna start with their tops. So the base color is this 71133 dirt. And of course I'm gonna light it up with a bit of the light brown. And using the light brown all the time helps to sort of tie in the figures together a bit better. Um, you know, to show that they're sort of in the same environment, even though there's some slight differences between the colors being used in their uniforms. It helps sort of tie it together a little bit better. Show that they're in the same, same environment. And you can see I'm not making, not making a huge change. There's not a big leap between um, you know, the base color and this lighter color I'm making. It's almost like just a mid-tone more than a highlight. And again, it's just a matter of sort of picking out all the high spots on the clothing where you would expect the, uh, you know, the light to show some highlights. The, um, the thing I really like about so this uh, this process too is you can, you can sort of always go back over it. If you think you've gone too far, you can go back to your base color and just go back over it. Yeah, now I'm done. Now this brown that I used on the top, it's called dirt, but the way it sort of looks when you paint it, it actually looks you know, it makes almost a convincing leather. So it's almost like a leather, yeah, uh, leather look to it. Uh, you can see, really subtle there. Not a huge, you know, amount of change. So while I've got that color mixed up, I'll do the other, the other figure as well. And certainly on the top of these you know, pouches. There's a little bit of a highlighting spot. It's uh, not looking too bad. Alright, so the next step is to do the pants on these two figures. Now looking at the pants on uh, these figures here, you can see this is the base colour and this is the sort of lighter color. I think it's going to be pretty close. So I think uh, I'm gonna brighten the base color up a little bit more just to make it a little bit more obvious. And again, it is just picking out those highlights. I don't think these ones are going to make a huge amount of difference to be perfectly honest. I think it's uh, the color's pretty close. But I do tend to find that with this stuff, you don't really know until it's until it's dried. Okay, 
that's pretty good for that one. The other thing to consider, you know, well, I guess another thing for me to consider in the future is I have spent quite a bit of time just on these three figures. So I'm already up to about sort of three or four hours uh, painting them, which I think is probably too much. And I think to make it a little bit easier on myself to take, you know, take a bit of time off, I might be better off doing the base coats actually with an airbrush. And I've actually done that in the past, but I thought this time I'll try something different. I'm going to try it just hand painting because I know uh, there's plenty of, plenty of people out there that do it, you know, just with a, a hairy stick. So I wanted to try it and uh, see how it went. But I think I think if I do this, if I do these kind of figures again, I will be airbrushing the base coat. But you sort of get an idea of how that's looking. It's looking pretty good. Yeah, I think that's pretty good. So what I need to do now is do the same thing for the gloves, except I don't think I'm going to mix up with the ochre on these gloves because I'm actually not really happy with the color of those. They're, it's they're a bit too green. So I'm just going to use the light brown just to lighten these up a bit. So there'll still be the sort of hint a hint of green underneath but it won't be as bad you know the difference between his left and his right uh, you can see yeah, it's quite a bit changed so it's a lot better I think I've said in plenty of my other videos that figure painting is not my certainly not one of my strengths I would like to get better at it but uh, to be perfectly honest I don't actually enjoy painting at this particular scale. I really enjoyed painting, uh, painting the Ripley figure for the power loader because that was a lot bigger. So it was one twelfth scale. I really quite enjoyed that. But uh, and you know when I was younger, I used to paint miniatures. And in fact. I painted quite a few minis when I was uh, here when I was younger. And back in the days with miniatures, you could get metal ones. They weren't all plastic like they are nowadays. But uh, one thirty-fifth scale, yeah. For some reason, I'm not really getting into it. I, it's kind of. I think it's because there's enough detail in there that you you can notice your your stuff ups as opposed to 28 millimeter scale, where you can actually get away with a little bit more. But it's not big enough, like a 112 scale figure, where you get, you know, plenty of opportunity to do the detail really well, because it's larger, it's easier to paint. So, there you go. Who knows, maybe it's just, just practice. I just need to practice and do more of them. Because these, uh, and that's certainly not a reflection of the quality of these figures from the, uh, you know, from the kit. They're really good, good quality figures. Really well sculpted and lots of detail. You know, so the the quality you'd expect to see in say a Tamiya, you know. To me, an armor kit that comes with figures. Yeah, I'm definitely liking the color of these gloves a lot better. I wasn't happy with how green they looked. Okay, I think I'm just going to get almost ready for an enamel wash. But what I'm going to do is let these things dry overnight. And uh, yeah, so do the enamel wash and then I can look at the decals. I'm just throwing some 
highlighting on the holster. Now my problem is when I'm painting figures, I tend to overwork them. <laughs> and they look like they're overworked, so I'm trying to uh, trying to show restraint. Um, so I know there's some people, you know, some amazing figure painters out there. You know, they'll spend ages and ages, sort of layer upon layer, and when you look at them, they don't look overworked. They look, you know, beautiful and clean and sort of. Um, yeah, really well, well painted, but I ain't that good. I think the sort of clothes are probably done as much as I want to. Just taking the smallest amount of uh, the light brown. Sort of picking out some of the extreme highlights. Now for the red berets, I think I'm going to try the same thing. So if it doesn't work, it's all right. It's not the end of the world. So take a bit of the red. So this is the 71084. It'll focus, focus. That yeah, camera's right playing up tonight. Fire red. Let's take some of this light brown and mix it in. And again, it's just about sort of tying all this stuff together so it looks like it comes from the same environment. And of course, you, know, you might be asking, oh, why not just add a bit of white or something like that? But the problem with um, and with white is it tends to create sort of these more pastel like colors and certainly with something like red you end up with um, you end up with pink which is not what I want what I want is just a sort of uh, I guess some a, a lighter version of the red that's on the cat okay because yeah, red is so transparent it's really hard to get a nice solid red down. So just a chance to have a look at the figures before I get a wash on them. So he's not looking too bad. The backpack looks a little bit messy, but I think that'll clean up once I get sort of a wash in there. I am kind of happy with the colors I've chosen though. It's a good sort of variation of brown without it being sort of over the top. And then we've got this guy's Ray's still drying, but he's coming up all right, I think. And then finally, we've got the guy with the eye patch. And again, you know, the skin's looking very stark at the moment, but that will, um, I'll darken that up once we start looking at the uh, using the oils for the, the flesh tones. But I think those characters, uh, you know, I think we're getting there now. I feel like I've sort of made some progress I spent so long actually doing the base coats it's it's nice to to see them starting to take form all right next step on to the enamel washes time to use a little bit of enamel wash just to bring out some of the some of the sort of finer details that uh, are on these figures now, anyone who's seen any of my other videos, you know I like to use, mix up my own enamel washes. Certainly you can use the Tamiya uh, panel line uh, stuff, which is really just really thin down enamel paint. But I like to mix up my own so I can get the color I want. Now, certainly for these two figures, what I want is like a dark brown. So I'm gonna take some XF10 and XF1. So some black and brown and mix them up. And then I'm going to add some X20 enamel paint thinner and thin it right down. So I've got like a little cup here. Let's start with the brown. Just 
just going to pour a little bit into the cup. A little bit of the black. I don't think I'll need a lot of the black somehow. This might be too dark. I might have put too much black in it, but you can... Yeah, you can see I'm using a very minimal amount here. Um, the next step is to add some X20 thinner to it. So, I'm just using an eyedropper here. And for this, I'm watering it down quite a bit. And the reason for that is because the thinner it is, the easier the panel wash will flow into, into the panel lines. And all those sort of nooks and crannies you want it to get into. So I'm just giving this a uh, thorough mix up. And I reckon I've got a bit the color about right. So you can sort of get an idea of how thin it is. You can see it's sort of just coming off the sides of the cup really easily. It's really thin. Now, use about filling up the brush. Just touching it to the surface where we've got um, where we've got sort of panel line areas. Now, I haven't got a gloss uh, surface on here, so it's not like the panel liner is flowing as well as it would if it was on a gloss surface. However, it still does flow a little bit. So it's just enough to sort of pick out the, uh, the details. And I'm going to use this one color pretty much for most of the, you know, defining most of the panel line or recess areas. Use it for most parts of this figure and also the, uh, the other one. You can sort of see how it's really bringing out the details in this uh, backpack thing. Still don't know what it is. It's almost like something for a like the still suit from June. The other thing to keep in mind is you really want to mix this stuff up regularly because it will separate out too. And you kind of get an idea of how that's bringing out some of that uh, some of that detail. It is reasonably subtle. The other thing it's doing is where I've painted a little bit outside the lines on some areas, it helps to disguise that as well. So my painting efforts weren't super flash, but this is going to help make it look a little bit, a little bit tidier. Now again, I'm going to be doing some separate uh, oil work on the the flesh. So his face and arms still look pretty stark, but at least his body's coming along. Just highlighting some of these uh, recess areas on his hat. Now I think for the grey components on these figures. I'll probably end up using a black wash so for that I probably will just use the to me a panel liner just because it's it's already pre-mixed and ready to go. I reckon that's about it that I need for that guy. I don't think he needs any more so I'll let that dry for a while. The good thing about using the to me enamel paints is you can really hone in the color tone you want for your wash so you're not sort of just restricted to whatever to me release you've got a bit more control over it and of course this is nothing new modelers have been doing this for decades and in fact 
my first experiences with modeling and painting models was with Humbrol enamels. As many people of my generation probably were too. Humbrol was sort of the, it was really the only kind of model paint available um, you know, locally where I lived at the time. So I had to learn how to paint with enamels and of course didn't have an airbrush so I used a hairy stick for everything I painted and the thing with enamels that I think is sort of the reason why um, you know they sort of come and go in, as far as in vogue as far as model makers using them you know they actually brush paint really well um, they tend to sort of self level out because they have quite a long drying time especially if they're thinned out a little bit so they tend to they tend to level self level reasonably well of course as modern as paints change over the years and different uh, formulas are made and you know, we get different uh, I guess different trends in the paints that we use and I know for me you know getting back into model making it was very much the water-based acrylics was what I got back into uh, with the airbrushing you know they're reasonably reasonably easy to work with and of course around the time I started this YouTube channel I discovered lacquers and I haven't really looked back I tend to only use the water-based acrylics now when I'm doing uh, when I'm doing figures all right so I think that's actually pretty good for that figure I'm pretty happy with that now for this figure I have to do something a bit different because his is more of a green than a brown so I'm going to basically repeat the process but this time I'm going to use uh, X27 which is black green I don't think I'll need I might just use a touch of black in there uh, we'll just see how it goes really don't need very much of this stuff okay so you can sort of see you know it's really a minimal amount of paint I'm adding and then I can just uh, fill it up with the X20 thinner all right now this here is very dark green but I think it'll work pretty well for this particular this particular figure I'll go ahead and finish this one off and the next step will be just cleaning off the excess enamel. Okay I finished the uh, enamel wash and I've put it under the hair dryer a bit to dry off. The other thing that I've done which is probably really hard to see is I've done the eyes and they are pretty rough. <laughs> um, they are pretty rough but that one's probably not too bad um, the commander is very concerned about something that's below him I think so that's <laughs> didn't quite line up his hip all right but just to explain how I did that I used a very uh, thin brush um, this is called the the psycho from the army painter um, very fine brush and I used a combination of uh, white grey the model color and also light brown and you can sort of see here this is the color that I use so it's really just not white and then for the pupil I just took the very small brush and just dotted in some 71 125 USA of brown so 
there was no way I was going to do that on camera uh, because my head would have been in the way. I apologize for that. And I am not very good at doing eyes. I can tell you that now. But literally, it's just get in there and a, a stroke across for the... Um, you know, for the white of the eyes and then just the dot of the brown for the, the middle. Okay, so cleaning up of the uh, enamel wash is pretty straightforward. I use this stuff, which is shellite, but of course you can use any type of enamel thinner. Given that I've done this over water-based acrylics, I don't expect this to have any effect on the underlying paint. I haven't given it a gloss coat, so it'll be interesting to see how we go. So I've just got a bit of uh, shellite decanted. I use a cotton bud and just go very gently. So get that in there, just dab off any excess. And then where I see areas where it's a little bit, you know, there's a bit of overbleed or a bit of a tied mark. Um, I'll just go in there and gently brush it off with the, uh, the cotton bud. So apart from the uh, decals and the flesh, I think he is done. Still looks very contrasty on the camera, but I think a lot of that's got to do with the light that I'm under. Uh, in real life, it's not actually that um, yeah, that that bad. All right, let's look at this guy. Yeah, it's definitely in the pants where it's really obvious. Now I'm doing all of this before I put the decals on. Um, because what will happen is the, the decals will go down. And once that's all done, it'll get a matte coat and then I'll look at the, uh, the weathering powders to go on. Yeah, this guy's probably the least... Uh, he's got the least sort of panel lines on him. So I'm going to give it a little bit of clean up, I think. And I call them panel lines, but they're really seam lines in the, in the clothes. All oh, right, so you can really sort of see, you know, that seam on the back there. That's where the, uh, you know, the wash really sort of brings out that detail. Now I use the Tamiya black panel liner for the belt. So... The underlying colour is grey, and if I gently rub over it, it sort of brings out the studs on the, um, on the belt. Okay, so next step is to start work on the flesh tones, I think. Okay, time for some experimentation with these oils for the flesh tones. So I've already started on one... Uh, one of the figures and still got a fair way to go I think um, but if you compare that with one that hasn't been done there is quite a difference there so these Abtai Lung 502 oils I am using a uh, basic flesh tone. So that's uh, this one here. Then I'm using flesh shadow, which is this middle one you see here. And then finally, just a touch of shadow brown, which is this final one down here. So these are the only three that I've sort of, yeah, you know, I've worked with. And I am using a little bit of this odorless uh, solvent, which is made for oil paints. So I'm just thinning it down a little bit and you can see I've started sort of mixing a little bit to get some sort of in-between tones. And so I'm gonna try and start this guy. Let's see if we can zoom in. Okay, so I'm gonna start with this sort of uh, basic flesh tone here and I can introduce a little bit more uh, a little bit more color I 
sure how well this is uh, coming up on the screen. It might be a bit too, too subtle. And the next point is I go a little bit darker. So I'm sort of building up the, uh, the shadow areas now. And certainly along his, his mouth. And his eyes. Go a little bit darker. The great thing about oils is that they take forever to dry. So you've got a huge amount of working time. There's that shadow area under his chin. And because you've got a lot of a uh, lot of time to sort of work with it, you can wet blend the oils. You can also take paint off, like what I'm doing on his brow at the moment, because I put a little bit too much sort of colour there. The next thing I want to do is go a little bit darker again. And this time just introduce a little bit of the really dark sort of shadow. So give him a little bit of five o'clock shadow on the sides. Okay, and then I can go back in with the lighter shade and just bring out his, his nose. Now, just the tips of his lips here. I might introduce just a little bit more colour in his lips. Getting a little bit darker, maybe. So, pretty rough but at least it gives the face a lot more detail. If we compare that to the other one here, let's see, I'm getting both in shot. You can see the chalk and cheese as far as the level of detail on the face. So going with a base coat of flesh was a good idea. Um, and now I'm just sort of adding that detail with the, uh, the enamels. So I'll go ahead and uh, do the rest of them and then show you how they come up. So I've finished the oil work on the skin tones. I'm not really that happy with them. Um, just go on to sort of get a bit of dirt on his face and around his neck. Being the driver, he'd be uh, covered in all sorts of stuff. But yeah, I don't know if it really came up that well. Um, I think it's uh, probably a bit rough. Uh, this guy is kind of interesting. I didn't realize he's actually got a scar on the side of his face So that sort of came up when I did the oils So it's a little bit more pronounced now um, Yeah, I think the oils have issues uh, Over the the lacquers because the lacquer is sort of almost a semi-gloss finish and so it didn't really um, Behave itself properly. So I think that's something to remember Maybe I need to put a matte coat down first before doing the oils over the top of the lacquers. But anyway, I mean, look, it's they're better than just having a straight flat colour. Um, try to give this guy a bit of five o'clock shadow. Um, I mean, and from the distance you're actually going to view them from, you know, if you're sort of looking at them from like that sort of distance, they look perfectly fine. You know, um, they actually look pretty good if you're sort of not right up close to them, which, uh, you know, people aren't likely to ever be that sort of close. But, um, yeah, so anyway, uh, next step is to do the decals. Okay, decals time. 
and I've come across a bit of an issue because I've already made a, a bit of a start as you can see here and I've had a couple of decals break up on me and I suspect that I mean, I bought this kit secondhand, but I, I suspect it's um, probably the first release of it back in 2009. So the decals are old. The sheet looks a little bit damaged. Um, the decals seem to be sticking, but they are just incredibly brittle. So to show you what I've done, you can see he's got like a little shoulder patch. He's got uh, two red stripes on his shoulders. He's got a couple of badges on his chest and one on his hat. And so it was actually two of the stripes that sort of broke as I was putting them down. So these things are pretty fragile. Um, and I think that's just because of the age of it. Uh, I've done the decals on this one. He's just got, you can hardly see it, but it's a number two on the back of his head and he has a badge on his shoulder there which is currently got some uh, microsole on it to try and soften it up a bit make it conform so i want to talk about um uh, just a, a couple of things i mean you've you've probably seen me do decals before but given the age of these decals and also the fact that i haven't gloss coated these figures before doing the decals i'm actually going to um, cut the right up to the edge of the decal so if i try and get this in the light properly you can sort of see there's if we look at this little badge down the bottom here that's going to go on his beret um, you can see there's a little bit of clear film just around the outside of the the badge shape and what i want to do is remove that and the reason for that is because i haven't got a gloss coat down there old decals i suspect that when i put these down if i was just to even though they're pre-cut that little clear spot around them will um, probably end up silvering which is where air will get trapped under those clear bits and it will look pretty ordinary so what i'm doing is i'm cutting right up to the edge and i'm not cutting very hard i don't want to cut through the uh, the paper just want to cut through the carrier film and i think that will help to prevent um, any silvering of these particular decals and it seems to have worked so far on the other ones so I think it'll be different for the other ones that actually go on the vehicle itself just because I will probably gloss coat that first and um, yeah I probably won't have the same sort of issue I don't think okay now I've already uh, pre-cut around the carrier film for this tiny little dot here this little logo so these are now ready to go into the water let those uh, soak for a bit and just talk about the um, you know some of the things that I use the decaling I use uh, microset and microsol so microset is you put that down before the decal and that will help reduce the surface tension so the the decals not sort of floating around it'll also soften the decal a little bit microsol will help um, melt the decal a little bit and it'll conform to the shape so really good for sort of irregular organic shapes this stuff is quite mild um, and you especially the microsol i tend to use multiple applications of it but it gives me a lot of control over you know how the the decal sits and so for example this one here i have applied two coats and you can see the shoulder patch is starting to uh, starting to conform to the folds of his shirt and so that's what the microsol is doing it's just bedding that decal down okay those decals are ready to go so i'm going to take some microset and just apply the tiniest bit to his beret where the badge decal is going to go And I've just set this up on 
blue tack just so that uh, you know so that it's easier for me to uh, apply the decal without having to chase the the figure around it might be hard to see but I actually have the decal and the tweezers there just let it drop down in place and I'm going to gently just sort of nudge it where I want it It doesn't matter if it's spot on at this stage because what I could do is use some microsole and once the decal softens a little bit I'll be able to manipulate it a little bit more. So at the moment it's sort of just getting it in the rough position. Okay, so at the moment and sort of floating there um, but it'll be alright I think once uh, once that decal softens up a little bit and hopefully this one's a little bit more straightforward so just a dab of microset uh, take the decal out and so what I'm doing here is just removing all that surrounding carrier film that I pre-cut Yeah, I want to make sure I've got it up the right way. There we go. I think that's right. So again, it's just sort of sitting there. It's kind of floating a little bit. Just might dab off a little bit of excess. And of course it's moved. I think, uh, yeah, given the age of these decals, I might, uh, I might be struggling a bit with them, I think. Uh, we'll see. Okay, so now I'm going to put some microsole on. A little bit on the badge again. Okay, and I'll leave that for a while, and then depending on how well it conforms, I might put another coat of microsole on it. But that is essentially it for the decals. All right, the final bit of work to do prior to the matte coat is the microphone, the Futter Edge microphone that uh, supposedly supposed to go on two of the figures. So um, if we see here, for example, we've got a Futter Edge E and also on this guy as well. So both of these guys are supposed to have microphones. Now I came across a problem where if you have a look at how tiny these microphones are and you see I've got one still on the sprue that I have, uh, I just painted that with black. So, um, but the problem is, is that this one is broken. So, um, it's a bit hard to show, but it's actually snapped in the middle. So it's not much to chop that one. The other one I did manage to get on with this guy. So thankfully I've got at least one on. And um, I didn't do it on camera because I thought it was going to be really fiddly, but actually it was pretty straightforward. Um, on this guy's headpiece, on his uh, headphones, there's actually a spot where the microphone goes. It's actually sort of reasonably obvious. There's like a little protrusion on one side where the microphone goes. And so it's just a little dab of super glue and then stuck it in place. And once it dried, I sort of bent the, um, bent the microphone. So that actually looks pretty good. However, this guy is also supposed to have a microphone, but it's not really clear where you would actually stick it to. So I kind of figure the fact that it, you know, one of them's broken. I think the uh, the driver here, he's um, yeah, he's not going to be using a microphone. So I think you know it's okay. But just be aware that if you're doing this photo etch stuff, be really careful of this because it has yeah sort of snapped in the the middle there. The other thing that I won't be using are the dog tags here. So that's what these are. So I won't be using those. Um, I'll hang on to them though. 
there might be another sort of uh, thing I have set up, you know, diorama or something where I might eventually get to use them. But um, <clears throat> there's really no kind of place to, to put them with this, um, you know, with this tank model. It's sort of a bit strange. You could try and hang these around the uh, around the figure's necks, but I reckon that would be more trouble than what it's worth. So I'm not going to bother with that. But uh, yeah, and the instructions sort of, you know, they uh, the expert instructions they sort of show. You know, here are all the dog tags here, and they've got to paint it up and stuff. But they don't sort of show them on the figure. Um, I reckon you'd have a hard time setting them up on the figure. So. Essentially the figures are done. It is just a matter of uh, giving them a matte coat and uh, taking them off the bases, doing a little bit of touch up where it's needed. The figures are finally finished. I've taken them off their bases, touched up their boots and given them a matte coat. Now I did mention earlier that I was going to add some, you know, potentially some pigment powders or um, to me a weathering products and I will be doing that but I'll be doing that in line with the rest of the tank just so that I get it consistent at the time of making this video I've painted the figures but I'm yet to start on the tank itself so um, I'll do the final sort of powder weathering along with the tank no glamour shots I'll save that for the next video which will show off the painting of the tank so until the next video I will catch you later